Hey everybody, Prince here. This is going to be a review for RevPro's High Stakes event, which took place uh, in late January of 2022 at York Hall. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to review the show because I saw there was a lot of hype for it, especially for the main event, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. But Overall, I thought it was a pretty solid show from top to bottom, pretty consistent. Uh, of course, obviously, the main event is uh, the selling point for this show, and I definitely think it deserves the hype. Uh, but before I begin, I just want to mention that I'm not really going to consistently follow the product in any way, I don't think. You know, I think this is just going to be a one and done for me, unless there's something in the future uh, that's going to call for me like, hey man, you got to check this out. This was an awesome match or holy shit. There was a huge title change or oh my god, Osprey finally lost the title. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll check that out. But for right now, I'm not really in like a, a mood to check out any promotion consistently. You know, I just been having a hard time trying to figure out what to do. I think AEW is just my going to be my way to go when it comes to like what promotion I'm willing to consistently follow, uh, at least for the time being. But uh, as far as this show goes, I thought the production values for the show were really good. Um, the hard cam uh, was uh, was positioned pretty well uh, to look at the ring. Uh, the lighting was good. The video quality was good. The audio was good. Uh, the only thing that sucked was the cameraman and the camera work uh, from the people at ringside because there were times where they were trying to catch a spot like from in the corner from like the one of the corners of the ring and sometimes they would just lazily put put the camera. It almost looked like that they put the camera on the on the bottom rope to, to hold it up properly because they were lazy or something like that. And I think you'll notice it when you watch the matches and if you pay attention closely because, man, there were times where I just thought, you know, move the fucking camera. I want to see the, the full picture of what's going on. And they, they would have to switch up to the hard cam at times. So, yeah, that was pretty stupid. But aside from that, production values were good. The crowd, a little inconsistent at times, but I think... For the big, big matches, they definitely were hot for them, especially the main event. But all that jibber-jabber out of the way, let's get into the show itself. Starting off, starting off you had uh, Lord Gideon Gray cutting a promo to start off the show, um, putting out an open challenge for anybody to face them, and then out came Alex Coughlin, who was one of the students at the LA Dojo. Uh, fate, uh, comes in, faces Gideon, and beats him in less than two minutes. A good little squash for, for Coughlin here, nothing I can really add to it. In terms of the discourse, uh, good little squash for him. Uh, before I continue, I forgot to mention that uh, I did not, I did see the um, the Road to High Stakes video on their YouTube channel, but I'm not really like paying full attention in terms of like the storylines and stuff like that. Like, oh, this is the direction that this angle is going. So if I mispronounce or if I uh, miss out on any details, I apologize. I'm just looking at it from the from the viewpoint of just the the quality of the wrestling. So yeah. Good little squash to open up the show. Uh, next up, we had Shota Umino taking on Yotosuji. Two graduates of the New Japan Dojo um, going on excursion to the UK. Shota has been in the UK, I believe, for a couple of years by this point. And uh, Yotosuji came in, I think, the uh, the previous year by, like, the summertime. And um, the storyline here was that Yotosuji lost a match to Gideon Gray, and he was forced to joined the Legion stable, which he's a part of right now, and uh, Shota Umino wanted to get him out of the stable because they're close friends, but uh, Shota getting attacked on various occasions, so which led to this matchup right here. Um, and, you know, this was a solid match. I didn't really think it was anything that great or that special, but it was just a good, solid little matchup. Uh, got a lot of time, about 16 minutes. Uh, a lot of matches on this card got a lot of time. Sorry for the awkward cut here. Uh, I just got a phone call, but yeah. Uh, a lot of the matches on the card got plenty of time, a couple of which I think went a little too long, but other than that, especially considering this show went four hours long, and I think there was like, what, eight matches on the card? Yeah, I think it was a little much, but either way, it, it you know, I really enjoyed it for a four-hour show. It's just that by the end of it, I was just a little tired, and uh, it took me a couple days to try to watch the whole show, but yeah, good match between Shota... Uh, Umino and Yotosuji here. Then you have Dan Maloney taking on Callum Newman. Good little power versus speed matchup. Nothing spectacular, just some good uh, back and forth action. Callum was pulling out some high spots, including a dive off the stage to the floor. Um, they were brawling by the ringside area, and they did some stuff in the ring. So yeah, you know, nothing I can really add to this matchup in terms of conversation. It was just fine for what it was worth. 
Then you had the Rev Pro British Women's Championship match. Alex Windsor defending against Charlie Evans. I've heard a little bit of Charlie Evans, mostly for some of her hardcore matches. Uh, I believe it's I believe it's in PWA Black Label in Australia. She had a a supposedly great uh, hardcore match with uh, what's her name Jessica Troy that Chris O'Brien recommended that I'm gonna try to check out one of these days. But uh, Alex Windsor, my first experience watching her in the ring, uh, pretty good solid talent, a good technician. Uh, nothing really I can add to the conversation here. Just a good solid women's match. Nothing more, nothing less. The post-match, no comment about that either since I'm not following the storyline, but all I'll say is that if you follow the, the promotion on a consistent basis, you might enjoy the, the post-match a little bit. But uh, yeah, good stuff. Then the show really starts to pick up here with the last four matches. Uh, next up, you get RKJ, a.k.a. Ricky Knight Jr., taking on Luke Jacobs. This was really, really, really good. It got a lot of time, about 22 minutes uh, just a good back and forth contest. Um, they did some stuff at ringside. There was, uh, I think, there was like a power bomb or something on the onto the ramp, and uh, they did some cool stuff in the ring. Some athleticism, some technical wrestling, good strikes back and forth. Just a really, really, really good match. I think if this was a little shorter, by like five minutes, I think this would have been a really nice tight. 15-minute uh, encounter, but yeah, really good stuff. Uh, Luke Jacobs was really solid, but I gotta say, Ricky Knight Jr. is just a hell of a talent. He just really understands the fundamentals really well, and I've heard great things about him, and I was impressed. I thought he looked really solid here. Um, very interesting to learn that that he's actually the nephew of Paige um, from WWE, which I did not know about, but I think it made a little bit more sense since Paige's real name is Soraya Knight, if I'm not mistaken, and her older brother has, and um, let me rephrase that. Um, her real name is Soraya Knight, and uh, RKJ is actually the son of Paige's older brother. So yeah, uh, just a really, really good solid matchup. Not a lot of time, good solid wrestling. So yeah, just really good stuff. I really enjoyed it. Uh, definitely one of the hidden gems on this show. Uh, then we have, uh, arguably, you could argue this is the match of the night, and I don't think anybody would really be pissed off about it. But next up, you have Gabriel Kidd taking on Francesco Akira. So Gabriel Kidd was coming off of uh, graduating the New Japan LA Dojo um, after training under Katsuyori Shibata. Uh, had a really rough like year in Japan, just being exclusively wrestling in Japan because of the pandemic. But he finally made his way back to the United States. Wrestled on New Japan Strong and then finally graduated from the from the LA Dojo. And I'm guessing that Gabriel is going to be wrestling in Rev Pro as part of his excursion. Which, uh, if that's the case, it sounds pretty good. Although, I know that there's been some recent um, turn of events that have uh, really put Gabriel Kidd in a negative spotlight. But I'm not really sure what the heck is going on. Uh, there might be a serious issue with them. But that could be saved for another time. But I gotta say, this match with Francesco Akira was awesome. Uh, Francesco Akira, I believe, is from All Japan. I uh, could be mistaken, but man, these two just went to war here. Uh, they just went right at it, right out of the gate. Uh, there was just a vicious chop to open up. Then they brawled to the outside. Uh, Francesco just launched, just dropkicked Gabriel into the into the guardrail. They brawled up the ramp, and uh, I believe Gabriel even did like a, an exploder onto the ramp, which was pretty brutal, and then they got back to the ring, and they just went back and forth with the strikes and the kicks, um, just a vicious matchup, really, really enjoyed this one, definitely one of the best things on the night, Gabriel was more of the, the bully heel in this matchup, just beating the shit out of Akira, but Akira just, you know, finding his way back, uh, trying to use his athleticism and some vicious strikes and chops to get back into the match. So yeah, definitely one of the best things of the night. Uh, if there's another match that's not the main event that you have some time for, definitely give this one a watch. It's only 15 minutes, but these two just went to war. Awesome, awesome stuff. Definitely check it out. Uh, then we have the Red Pro British Heavyweight Tag Team Championship match. Sunshine Machine of TK Cooper and Chuck Mambo defending against Aussie Open of Kyle Fletcher and Mark Davis. Uh, from from the small sample size I've, I've had with Aussie Open, I think they're a really damn good team. Uh, I saw their matches with Will Ospreay and Paul Robinson in progress. Kyle Fletcher had a really good singles match that with somebody that I'm not going to mention by name in the 2019 Super Strong Style 16 tournament. 
And uh, I heard they had two really awesome tag matches last year. One in PWA Black Label Pro against, I believe, it, I, I don't know if this is the, the proper name of the team, but against the Velocities uh, when they returned after Mark Davis's injury. And then uh, another really awesome match in Rev Pro. I believe it was against Michael Oku and, unless I'm mistaken, Ethan Allen? Is that his partner's name? I forgot I forgot the dude's name. But yeah, at the High Stakes event just a few months ago. But they're challenging here for the Tag Team Championships. So the storyline here was that Sunshine Machine surprisingly scored the Tag Team Championships uh, a few months prior. Uh, Aussie Open attacked them uh, after a matchup a few months prior. And then after various different attacks, they were suspended. And then finally, Sunshine Machine wanted the match against them for the Tag Team Championships on this show. And that's what we that's where we're at right here. And uh, yeah, I gotta say, this was a great tag match. It went a little too long. It went nearly 30 minutes. I would have liked it a little more if it was uh, cut by like maybe 8 minutes and maybe go like 18 minutes at most. Because uh, they were trying to do something very similar to what the to what FTR did in their match with Punk and, and Mox a couple weeks ago on Dynamite with the double the double hot tag where um where one of the baby faces gets worked over, they get a hot tag, but then the that second baby face gets worked over, and then uh, we get another hot tag. So they try to do something like that. It, it didn't really work as well as the, the Dynamite match, but uh, I think once they got going in terms of the action, it definitely really uh, picked up by the end of it. The last 10 minutes pretty much had some spectacular um, strikes and high octane moves just really fun vintage tag action i like i said if this was a little shorter i think this would have been even better than it already was tk cooper is a tag team veteran having teamed up with another person i'm not going to mention by name uh in progress a few years ago um chuck mambo i've seen very very little to nothing of uh from progress a few years ago but these two worked pretty well together mambo was just more of the high flyer doing more of the athletic stuff, while T or, and TK could do some of the power mixed in with some athleticism. So they worked really well here as a team in this matchup. So yeah, really surprisingly good. Um, surprisingly really good to great tag match. Uh, a little long, but it ended up being great in the end. So definitely check this one out if you have the time. But then, of course, we get the main event. the For the Red Pro British Heavyweight Championship, Will Ospreay defending against Michael Oku, who is actually the Red Pro British Cruiserweight Champion going into this matchup. So, I don't know if it was established from the first matchup, but these two had a match a few months prior in South at one of their Southampton shows, which ended via a referee stoppage. And then Oku wanted a rematch. He would get it against Osprey here for the show, this time for the championship. Uh, there was a couple of segments that they showed on the, uh, the Row 2 video on their YouTube channel, if you want to check it out. One of which was where Will Osprey was uh, decided to give... Oku, an early Christmas present, and that being uh, ticket, front row tickets to the high stakes event for uh, Oku's mom, his brother, and his girlfriend, and uh, started to really talk shit and try to get under Oku's skin, which really built up some good tension for this matchup. And then there was another segment uh, sometime later where Oku talked to the referee of, the ori of their original matchup saying, I know you're going to be the, the referee for the second matchup, for the rematch here. But I want to ask you for a favor, and that is to not, um, not to try to pull any ref stoppages at all. Even if we're in, if one of us are in danger, or if one of us can't really answer the matchup, I want the match to end by pinfall or submission. So basically, you could the match could only end by pin or submission. The referee could not do anything in this matchup, uh, aside for pin, submission, count out, or DQ. And uh, that's where we're at here. Just in a really good hype video. To build up more of the intensity and the and the tension between the two going into this matchup, and we actually do see Oku's mom, brother, and girlfriend at ringside. And uh, I gotta say, this matchup going in, I had some reservations of it for a few reasons. The first being obviously the runtime of forty one minutes. I had my criticisms of the Okada Osprey match from the Dome. Like they they definitely work well together, but just something was missing for me to say that I I really love the match as much as some of the others that those two guys had in the past, uh, especially compared to the G1 match in 2019. The other being that, um, what was the other thing? That there was a lot of hype behind this, like, oh man, this was a five-star match. This is one of the best matches of the year so far. So I thought the hype would have probably killed it for me, especially considering, like, people were talking about, it's a five-star match, five-star match, referring to Meltzer's rating, and I'm like, eh, I don't know. 
And, um, you know, I wasn't really familiar with Michael Oku. Uh, the only match I saw from him was a tag match in progress a few years ago, teaming with some dipshit who should not be ever named in pro wrestling again, uh, against Walter and Shigehiro Irii, which was pretty awesome. And he looked really good in that match, honestly. That was my only exposure to Michael Oku at all, but... I gotta say, he really stepped it up here against Osprey. Just a fantastic babyface performance in this matchup. Just really selling the brutality of Osprey's offense from the hidden blade to the different power bombs and the os cutters, and uh, just a, just a great babyface performance. But not only that, he really just brought a viciousness to some of the strikes uh, against Osprey. Like whenever Osprey pissed him off, uh, he would just go right at him, you know, striking with him, kicking him. And then just great intensity when he locked in the, the single leg crab in some of the later portions of the matchup. But I gotta say with Osprey, this might be my favorite match, or at least my favorite performance of his in a long while. Uh, my favorite match, my last favorite match of his was probably the, the Zack Sabre Jr. matches in 2020. And then the, um, which one was I talking about? What, or the, the New Japan Cup match last year, sorry. I don't know how the, the Dontaku match with Shingo holds up from last year. I'm going to have to rewatch it sometime down the line. Um, but in terms of performance, especially as a heel, holy shit, Osprey was just vicious in this match. Uh, the first 10 minutes was kind of standard affair, as you would expect. You know, they're really, But the thing I respected about this matchup was that they didn't overdo it in terms of like the high spots and the athleticism. They saved some of the big bombs for later in the matchup or... You know, when the match needed a little bit more energy or when the emotion really needed to pick up. So, yeah, I'm glad that they refrained from, like, overdoing it with high spots. Especially considering Oku's a cruiserweight wrestler and Osprey being well-known for his flippy shit. But they really helped, they really toned it back in this matchup, which I really enjoyed. Uh, but the, the moment... Uh, what was I going to say? But, man, Osprey, when, when that moment when Oku got shoved off the top rope and went crashing through the timekeeper's table by the over by the entrance way yeah i think the match really started to pick up and it's crazy because for a match that goes 40 minutes i was never bored uh i you know there were some moments of drag a little bit and, and i thought maybe they could have tightened things up in some places but man they just really worked in this matchup uh just good intensity you know the crowd was really into oku really wanting him to beat osprey's ass and beat him for the championship um uh, Oku gets beaten down and bloodied up, uh, Osprey just punching him right in the face to try to open up the wound more. But the two most memorable moments in this matchup, I would say, was when um, Osprey was bringing over Oku over by his family, and then Osprey was talking shit to them, and then uh, Oku's girlfriend threw a drink at him, talking shit, and then he grabbed her, pulling her over the railing. And looked like he was about to strike her, and then Oku just comes out of nowhere and, and beats the shit out of Osprey, getting pissed at him, and then hitting a dive off the top rope, which bloodied, which I don't know how, but it busted him open. And, uh, you know, even though I think the, bl the blood could have came off a little better, especially in comparison to Hangman Page's three blade jobs from the last, uh, from the Danielson matches and the Texas death match, uh, it still looked pretty good for, for the most part for this matchup. And uh, the other memorable moment was the near the ending. Uh, right near the end when Osprey is in control and then he hits a couple of hidden blades, one to the back of the head and then the other one to the face. He looks like he's about to pin him and get the win, but he decides to pull him up, hit him with another hidden blade, goes for the pin, picks him up again, hits another one, and uh, and it provokes both Oku's girlfriend and uh, Oku's um, uh, tag partner uh, to consider throwing in the towel, even though that would have not really mattered at all because... Uh, of the stipulation that the match had to end by pin or submission. And uh, you, you just really felt the emotional tension. You know, this was probably like the same amount of emotional tension as the as the the throw in the towel situation during the, the Mustache Mountain uh, Undisputed Era tag match from 2018 on, on NXT TV. If you've seen that match, you know what I'm talking about. But the emotion was just really there and... These two guys just really killed it here, man. Just the, the, the emotion was there. The crowd did not want to see the towel thrown in. But you also didn't want to see Oku get murdered. But he pretty much got murdered in that moment. Then Osprey hits another hidden blade. Picks him up. Hits the Stormbreaker to get the victory and retain the championship. 
yeah, this was fantastic. I, I was not expecting this match to be as great as it ended up being. Now, would I say it's the match of the year so far? Is it five stars? No, because like I said, there maybe could have been some tightening up in the pacing in some areas, but I think the emotion and the storytelling in this matchup was really great. Uh, just really enjoyed it. For a match that went nearly 40 minutes, I really dug it. Um, probably one of Osprey's better matches in the last couple of years, uh, especially after bulking up back in 2020. Uh, definitely a great performance from him as a heel. You just hated his guts, and you wanted to see Oku just step up and win the championship here, even if you knew that uh, he wasn't going to win. But yeah, great matchup. I know I've gone uh, a little longer than expected. I'm going nearly 20 minutes, I believe, or even over 20 minutes with this review. But yeah, I just had to give my pr the, the praise that the main event deserved. It was fantastic. If you haven't seen it yet, definitely check it out. But the show as a whole was uh, generally great. Um, the, the main event was fantastic. Francesco Akira, Gabriel Kidd was awesome. The tag title match, while a little long, was great as well. Uh, um, RKJ versus Luke Jacobs was really good. And everything on the undercard was pretty solid. So yeah, even though it's a little bit of a long show, if you just want to check out the last four matches I talked about, definitely give it a watch. There's some really good talent on the show. And again, that main event was fantastic. So if you haven't seen the show already, give it a watch and let me know what you thought of it in the comment section below. And with all that said, uh, let me know what you thought of this review in the comment section below. Was there any details that I was missing that I should have done a better job on? Uh, which show do you think I should cover uh, in the future in this format? Do you like this format? Should I go back to slideshow reviews? Um, do let me know what you thought of, of this in the comment section below. And until the next video comes, guys, peace.